Good morning, Cornerstone. It's an exciting morning here. Would you stand with us? We're, we're so glad you're here. We're glad you're here online. Um, let's pray before our Father and have him help us with this gathering. Father God, we are so excited to be here this morning. We're with family, and we're in your family, and we just thank you for that. We ask that you'd be with every single aspect of this gathering this morning. Bless us as we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to read together, if you would. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and so with him with music and song. For the Lord is great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Amen. Never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. 
Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Waker, miracle worker, promise keeper, fight in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And you are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Great, your love was greater. What could 
into our communion time. We just want to invite all believers to partake. There are uh, tables up front. There are tables in the back. And after the prayer, you may um, serve yourselves. You may be seated. Good morning. I was burning brush the other day and, and a branch caught my glasses and, and winged them into the fire. But I got these for a buck fifty. <laughs> Any comments? Meet me in the prayer room. Last week, here at this time, Gary spoke of an unworthy manner in partaking in this meal. And this should not be so. So again, and again, what might be a worthy manner? Well, James 4, 6 tells us God gives grace. He gives grace. He gives the entire New Testament to the humble. Well, what does that look like? Maybe this will help. I was reading this just recently and uh, kind of blew my mind. In the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 15, verses 12 through 15. And this is uh, King Aja. It was raised up by the Lord to bring some insight to the people who had some conduct issues. Basically told them that if you're with God, he'll be with you. And we'll win some battles. And they did. So this is what they came up with after recognizing that. And then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was to be put to death. Whether small or great, whether man or woman. Then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice and shouting and trumpets and ram's horns and all of Judah rejoiced at that oath for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with all their soul and he was found by them and the Lord gave them rest all around. He was okay with them purging the messy stuff. And I thought about what our Christian community would look like if that were still true. One of us were to just be caught messing up a little bit. Kill him. Just put him out. Off him. Well, something had to be done. And it was. And we know it is the cross. The New Testament, the object of communion, according to the scriptures, to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Why? Well, there's every reason, but the main reason was, was that we were weak in our flesh. Let us never forget this promise that he gives us in time of communion. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you. He never stops working. The something that had to be done is being done right now in us. We're not killing one another for our mistakes. We're meeting with one another and we're working them out by the Holy Spirit that we received in Jesus Christ when he was risen from the dead. He sits at the throne and we boldly come and ask him to do that. And then one day, we'll drink of the new cup and the new kingdom. Amen? Let us pray. God, dear Heavenly Father, help us to be found in peace, trusting you, praising you humbly, and thankful 
that you don't kill us for our conduct and condition, but rather work all things out according to your grace, according to your mercy, and according to your truth. And so as we take your emblems that represent the flesh that soaked up our sin and died to it and died for it, that even now we're being put to death in our flesh and made alive in the spirit by coming to you and listening to your message and your truth. Recognizing how desperate we are for that. And then in that praise and that joy, you begin to speak a little bit more boldly to those that don't know you, that don't know that. Thank you and praise you for this morning and in everything you do and are doing. Amen. Today we are uh, talking about the subject of praise, and it seems worth uh, just beginning with some praise that uh, some of you may or may not have noticed that we have uh, our dearly beloved elder overseer Dan Fritz present with us today, and it's worthy of... uh, And that is certainly worthy of praise. We have been created to praise, and it can be evident in lots of different interactions and things that we do as we go about our weeks. We praise a good sports play when we see it, even if it's not our favorite team. Come on, friends, like we've all sat there on the couch where we've watched the team that we despise, and they make some great plays, and we're like, all right, even I have to admit, that was a great place. We praise things. We praise a chef for delicious food that uh, many people talk about the freshman 15 when you go to college. I had the, the, uh, 
the newly married 15 when my wife began to cook for me. You praise people for various things. We praise businesses for good customer service. We praise our kids when they make admirable decisions or when they perform something well. We praise our dogs for being alive. You ever think about that? Good dog. We've done nothing. They're just standing there looking at you. We have been created to praise, and it's evidenced by even some of the little things within our lives. And I think we are people who praise because we were created in the image of God. We were created to praise. Now, I've got to be honest up front today and give credit where credit is due, uh, that uh, this past week, as it seems like it often happens and as should happen on a regular basis for me, is when I'm studying a text and when I'm studying a topic, uh, that God first does a work in me. And um, there's a book here I want to recommend to everybody. It's a small little book if you're not a reader. It's one that um, anybody can read because it's, it's little and it's small. And actually the main content is only about 100 pages. And it's a book titled Sing by who you probably recognize the name, Keith and Kristen Getty. And so there's much, I'm going to quote them often unapologetically because much of what they said are things that had an impact, a profound impact on me. And here's why it had a profound impact on me. It's because when I was growing up, and even into my teen years, and even into my early years in, in college and in ministry, that if you were to ask me what made a good church, I, I mean, let me rephrase that. If I was to describe to you without being prompted what a great church is, I would begin to describe the music that was sung from a stage. I would describe the style in which it was sung. I would describe the band which was there. I would describe the context of the room in which all of that was, was done. And then I grew in maturity a little more, and I realized that that's not the measure of what makes a good church, of what makes a faithful church. That that might be an asset, and that may be a good thing, but then I came to a different conclusion, and it wasn't really that many years ago where I would say something along the lines of, hey, you know what we can have, we can gather as a church without a single song being sung. And that's practically true. But the work that has been done in me recently, and I would say even within recent months, like it is practically true that we are, we can be the church, we can gather as the church without singing a song, without striking a chord. That is practically possible. But I've recently come to the conclusion that I'm not sure it's actually completely faithful. That the shift in my mind and and being confronted with scripture after scripture after scripture many of them on which I'm going to share with you today I now understand that music and singing is to be ingrained into who we are as the people of God and to clarify it's not something that is to be produced for us that we watch but singing and music is something in which we participate in And it's a key part of our spiritual lives and our spiritual growth. In Getty's book, they write, it goes against the grain of how God created our humanity for us to keep from praising all that is praiseworthy. To keep quiet about what we are pleased with. And a way in which, historically, throughout history, throughout the creation of mankind, and certainly throughout biblical history, one of the dominant ways in which God's people have expressed praise is through music and song. Gettys go on to say, since God is most worthy of our praise, above all other things, since he is most deserving of our love, above all other things, since 
He is most deserving of our love above all other people. We will respond not only by knowing we should praise him, but by feeling we cannot help but praise him. And when we go through the book of the Psalms, and we've gone through quite a few, that is abundantly clear. That we're actually going to go to the very end of the Psalms. We're going to wrap up this series today, and we're going to go to Psalm 150. The end of this collection, which says this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord Praise the Lord. You do not have to be a Bible scholar to preach this text today. You may not have ever studied this text before or read this text before right now. You know abundantly clear what this message is of this psalm. That there is a rally cry of God's people. To be called to be a gathering of people. Like, keep in mind, the book of Psalms is a collection of songs that people have used to sing. That have been accompanied by, by instruments a lot of times. To be expressed, to be sung as God's people to God. And the book ends with one real clear message. Real quite simple. You could preach it. And it was just said multiple times that we're to be people who praise God. And it's not only Psalm 150, it's actually the last five psalms of the collection of the Psalter. It's hundred, and the Psalter is the collection of psalms that's 150 psalms. And the last five end with no requests, just simple praise of God and a call to praise him. We have, uh, of these 150 psalms, since about Christmas time, if my calculation is correct, we've looked closely at only about 17 of those psalms. But there's a number of ways in which we lingered on some of the truths that are expressed there. We lingered on our trust level of God. We lingered on the ways in which we are to live carefully. We lingered on God's glorious design for mankind and for all of the world. We lingered on God's wisdom. We lingered on God's forgiveness, God's desire for unity. We lingered on our, our position before God. In Psalm 51, we lingered on the purity of heart. We lingered on the gospel. We lingered on his glorious son. We lingered on Jesus as our trailblazer, that one that was foretold to make a way for us to follow him, who has gone before us. And we lingered on the crucifixion of Jesus, just to name some of those 17. And throughout these collection of psalms, what we found is that in worship settings, there's a whole lot of things in the, uh, within this collection of, of worship songs that confront our human hearts, that teach us, that show us it's okay to express in certain ways. They show us times of lament, of just asking God why. We saw moments of, of confession. We saw moments of repentance. We saw a call at the very beginning in Psalm chapter 1 to linger on God's instruction, to trust him in all of his ways, even when the situations around us just seem like they're falling apart. And all of those, all of those experiences, all of those expressions, all of those subjects that we've lingered on, there has been a scarlet thread through the whole thing. And I think the last five psalms, particularly Psalm 150, shows us exactly where this is all driving us to. It's driving us to singing praises to God. Like I, I don't need, really need to expand on what this text says. I just, I just want to, here literally there's about this much, this much room here that I want to just expand on what the text says. It's just hearing first, it was just a call to praise, and it doesn't even give specific reasons as to why to praise God. After all, this is Psalm 150 of 150. But the, the crescendo of the entire psalm is a call to praise, and it's a call to praise enthusiastically. It's a call to praise because of the wonderful things that God has done and the wonderful one that God is. 
that his majesty surpasses all others. And that he's used that majesty, he's used that power to be a deliverer of his people. Praise him for his acts of power. What they have in mind as they pin that is, is the acts of power in which he brought his people deliverance. It was he brought them rescue. He brought them early pictures of salvation that we now have a full picture of. And then it ends with the very end after it's calling for like, like pull out all the instruments. I find it really interesting in, uh, of this psalm. I find it really interesting that they don't actually know what all of these instruments are. If I remember correctly, there's about seven different instruments mentioned here. And they're not even specifically sure what they all are. Like scholars can't pinpoint exactly what they are. But we know there's string instruments. We know there's wind instruments. We know that there's percussion and loud, loud cymbals. Praise the Lord for that. Drummer here. And all of that is to accompany the last verse, which is the apex, the center, the reason in which all those instruments are played is for every, breath, every person, every being that has breath to praise the Lord, for every being that has breath owes its, owes its existence to God. And that's how this collection of psalms ends. There's no need to complicate the message. It's simply a summons to sing praises to God. And maybe you're looking, well, it technically doesn't say singing. Maybe you're going, well, I'm not one who likes to sing. I, you know, it's not really my thing. So maybe it's kind of optional. I, I don't, I don't know that it's that optional. In fact, we sing often. Have you thought about the settings in which, which we sing? We sing at birthday parties. Most of us don't hesitate normally to sing at a birthday party. Uh, we, we sing uh, when we go to uh, stadiums. In fact, let me see if my phone will work here. Just, we're going to do a little test here. Now, there's times that, that we'll sing, like we'll, we'll sing our national anthem. How about that? You ever think about the fact, why do we, why do we uh, sing our national anthem and don't just recite it? I think because there's something about the way God has made us and the way that music brings to life something that's powerful within us. But we don't just recite national anthems. We sing them because they mean something. Or when we're gathered in, in stadiums, we'll sing our, the fight songs of, of our... I'm not going to play that, don't worry. We'll sing the fight songs. But even when we're gathered in stadiums, we will sing songs that have absolutely nothing to do with the game. I mean, yeah, I get it. Baseball, we got the seventh inning stretch. We'll sing Take Me Out at the Ball Game. But there's also songs. We'll see if this works. Okay, we'll see if this works. Um, there's other songs that, that are sung. And, and feel free, like, to you just, just get in the moment here. We'll see if it works very well for me. Let's check it out. You all sing. <laughs> See the point? We all, stop it. Quiet, Neil Diamond. <laughs> we all sing. Like there's something within us that has this, this desire and this enjoyment from singing. This isn't just some extra thing. It, it's a part of who we are as God's creation. It's always been a part of the history of God's people. And it's evident by when we gather in a football stadium, we're singing Neil Diamond for peace sake. So it doesn't even make sense. We just enjoy it and have fun doing it. Consider these various passages. Now, this isn't an isolated, like, we like, okay, fine, the Psalms talks about it, and certainly they do. Psalm 95, 1 and 2. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol uh, extol with music and song. Psalm 98, 4 and 5. Shout for joy to the Lord. All the earth, burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with harp, with the harp and with the sound of singing. Psalm 149, one of these, one of these songs of Hillel, these praise psalms that are at the end here. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of his faithful people. 
That's, not, that's skipping over the fact that in moments of, of great deliverance of God's people, people like Moses and Miriam, they would write songs and then they would, they would direct the people of Israel to sing these songs in times of deliverance. But it's not just the Psalms, it's not just Old Testament. I shared it with somebody this morning. Like I, this is, was my conviction here, is, is I always thought of singing as just kind of an extra piece that's kind of nice to do and it's good for us to, to sing praises, let alone the fact that what, what picture do we have in Revelation? What's the picture? Singing to God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And by the way, there is some repetition. If you're one that goes, I don't really like the repetition on some of these songs. Holy, holy, holy. Same word, one word repeated three times. And we see that repeatedly within the scripture. There's repetition. Why? It's because it's something that we are declaring or it's something that we are surrendering to. And if, you're, and if you're one that likes repetitions in songs, there's, there's other songs like within Psalms that we don't even quite understand what all the words mean because it gets difficult and complex. And here's the truth. There's a place for both. It's not about the style of worship. It's about the engagement in which we participate in when we sing. But that's not all that the scripture has to say about this. Acts 2, 46 and 47, this is the one that got me. The Restoration Movement Church, if you've grown up in the Restoration Movement Church, you know that one of the passages that we absolutely love is Acts chapter 2, 46 and 47. It talks about the, the first assembly. Peter preaches the first day uh, on, on the day of Pentecost. He preaches the gospel sermon. He preaches that Jesus is king. Many people repent and are, are baptized. Thousands are gathered. And then at the end of it, we get a picture of what they're doing. And there's a few things that we always emphasize, but there's one we missed out, and I hadn't even seen it. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Sounds familiar, right? Verse 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. I don't think in light of the Old Testament and all the singing that's prevalent, in light of the fact that Jesus, before he goes to the cross, you know what Jesus did? In the upper room, breaks communion. Do you know what they did before he went to the cross? They sang a hymn together. I don't think when this says they were praising the first picture of the church, I don't think it, that's only like just the expressing praise. They certainly were. I am almost certain. I'm not going to put money on it, but I'm almost certain that they were singing. That they were a singing people because throughout history, biblical history, God's people have been a singing people. I also think that's true because in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas have been, have been severely beaten. They've been placed into a terrible prison. And they've been persecuted for their faith. And what is it that they're doing? They're singing. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Later, Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. What does it look like to be filled with the Spirit? Speaking to one another. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. That's Colossians 3.16. How about Ephesians 5? Let's go back there. I'm going to finish up that text. I combined them. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Singing seems to be something of significant importance to the people of God, including the church. But because this message is clear, I, I just want to draw our attention to, for the rest of our time here, the question of why. Like what, what would be the benefit to singing, especially if, especially if you're one of the ones that just sing Neil Diamond, but you say you don't sing? Uh, That if you're going, I just, I don't know, it's just not my thing. I can't sing, I can't carry a tune. Listen, one of the, one of the most, like, if, for, if you're one of those people, you're like, I'm tone deaf. I, I just want you to know from, um, that I've heard from others, and, and I'm on this way as well, that I was sitting in a, uh, a larger worship space uh, back in February. I'm in a church that I was attending, and behind me was a guy who was 
absolutely tone deaf. Absolutely. And, and he didn't have a little voice. He had a big voice. And he wasn't afraid to share his tone deaf voice. And it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> to be around someone that didn't care, it was contagious. You couldn't help but want to sing. And it wasn't to drown him out. <laughs> It was just singing and proclaiming praises to God with absolute reckless abandon, not being concerned with who was around him. It was contagious. So why is singing so important to God? I, I've, got, I, I've got five quick reasons I want to touch through why I, I think singing is important. Number one, it puts our position before God to practice. It puts our position before God to practice. To praise, to sing praises to God is to exercise our mind and our emotion. It takes our mind to places to recognize who God is. It declares and sings truths of him, which places us in a position lower than he is. If we're expressing praise and worship to him, it places us in a position of a worshiper. It puts us in our proper place and it practices it. If we want to learn anything in our study of the Psalms, is that there is an infinite list of reasons to praise God. And Psalm 150 is a broad view of his mighty acts and his surpassing greatness. I mean, just let's pause to consider how these songs have come about. Something that, that is, is enjoyable to do is to consider the backgrounds to, to music and as to why, why someone wrote them. They oftentimes wrote them when they were thinking about their own walks and, and they're, they're, they're con going through scripture and they're declaring truths of God and they want to put that to some melodies so that other people can join in and sing in that as well. It's a way to take God-given creative arts and to declare truths of God with melodies that, that can be declared as a body of believers. Getty's right. Worship comes as a response to revelation. Worship comes out of a response to revelation. That is, God has revealed his character, his ways, who he is to us in his truth, in, in his word. And as we come across those truths, we are driven to worship and in gratitude and appreciation of him. The truth of God always puts us in our place as created beings worshiping a creator. It always puts us in our place as, as delivered beings worshiping the deliverer, as a redeemed people worshiping the redeemer, and as mortal beings worshiping the one who is immortal. That why I should sing praises to God? Because it puts us in our, it, uh, it's us willingly practicing to put ourselves in our proper place, which comes from the second one. Why sing praises to God is because it instructs us in truth. Worship, singing praises, instructs us in truth. It is well attested, studied, and documented that music is a powerful teacher. Why is that? Because God made it so. What well, is one of the best ways to memorize something? Put a little jingle to it. We all know this annoying commercials. So I'm not going to go there because we'll all be stuck on that the rest of the time. <laughs> our kids, we homeschool our kids, and uh, uh, our, one of our kids in particular was just, does not like math, can't stand math, and yet we came across this, uh, um, this tool that it was uh, the times tables to song. And it, it like, it, was, it cost us a little bit of money. We're like, I don't know if it's worth it or not, but, you know, the teacher in my household, not me, was like, it's worth a try to, to, to get them to learn their, their timetables. And, and, and so we bought them, they got them, and it was like within 24 hours, I get a video sent to me of all three of my children. One of them isn't even close to learning multiplication yet, that they're singing the timetables. There's something about when we put it to song that it's a great teacher for us. Or how about this? At times, our aging minds fail us to the point that we can't remember somebody's name, including people that we have lived with our entire life, and yet, and yet, can remember every single word of a psalm, of a hymn. 
that they grew up singing. The songs that we have on our lips in worship services are powerful teachers. But there's a couple of caveats we need to give here. That also means that we need to make sure that the songs that we're singing are actually declaring truth. We do need to be careful of that. There are songs that are written that don't do that. And that's just a quick little caveat. I don't, we don't want to need to hang out there. But if our songs are going to be a powerful teacher, we want to make sure that they're teaching what is true. And then one more important reminder of it instructs us in truth is that what we praise and what we worship impacts who we are. What we praise and what we worship impacts who we are. One of the many reasons why commitment to worship gatherings are so important, especially for families with those that are a young age, is that when you spend time praising something, it works its way up the importance level within your life. If we spend a great amount of time praising political positions, it doesn't take long before we look like a politician. If we spend a great amount of time praising athletic performance, the bleachers quickly become temples of worship. If we praise the almighty dollar, we become consumers and we become hoarders. But if we are disciplined and worshiping in truth, we become faithful followers of the one in whom we worship, the Lord Almighty. What we praise and worship impacts who we are. It is not just something that we watch. It is not something that is idle. But when we participate in it, it impacts who we are, which is why it is crucial for our own spiritual growth. Why do we sing praise? It instructs us in truth. And number three, why do we sing praise? Why is it important? Because it propels us to live faithfully. The word propel really for me is the word inspire. It inspires us to live faithfully. You know, and many of you probably know, and I know that it is powerful to be part of a body of believers who sing together in truth to a God who is worthy of being worshipped. There are few things that, has, that, that doesn't leave a, a bigger mark on our minds of the impact moments of big, uh, reckless, abandoned worship gatherings have had on our lives. Frankly, that's why it can be dangerous to have worship discussions at times because we became so attached to them or the experience that we had with them. But it is a powerful tool that can propel us towards faithful living. It may not be everyone's story, but when I think through the archives of my own faith journey, some of the most propelling, inspiring moments in my faith was when I was moved by a song. Not, not moved by a song, but was, was moved to sing a song. Let me clarify that one more time. When I think back on the archives of my faith journey, and I look back at some moments in which were so influential for me, it wasn't merely the song that I was singing. It wasn't like I heard a song and I was moved by it. When I really think back, and I think if you really think back about it as well, what happened was God moved and you were moved to sing. You were moved to sing. The movement of God happened first, and it drove me to sing a new song. And it drove me to moments of surrendering of my own ways and to sing the one who had, had saved me. I, I think of uh, one particular when, when I was at a, a CIY conference. And I've told my story before of how I was a punk teenage kid that didn't want to be there. It was arms crossed, hardened of heart. And yet as the week went on and as I was surrounded by God's word and I was surrounded by people who loved and they cared for me, I will never forget singing the words of a song called Still. I don't remember the verses. The verse went like this, Find rest my soul in Christ alone. Know his power and quietness and trust. And then the chorus, which I will not forget, is when the oceans rise and the thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. 
She's like, I don't have a great memory. That song has not been sung in quite in a minute. And yet those are words that I didn't even know what the song title was called, but I got my Google search in preparation for today, and I just typed in the words of that chorus. I didn't miss a beat, and it told me exactly what song it was. Gettys again write, the lyrics of the songs we sing in our churches and repeat in our hearts find their way into shaping our priorities, our behavior, our loves. Into the quiet space of the car journey on a Monday morning, into the language of our prayers as we fall asleep, into the answers we give for the hope that we have. Singing praises to God propels us toward faithfulness. You all, a little bit, many of you, overwhelmed me a bit uh, as I put a little Facebook post out there. <laughs> exactly. I, I just quickly, I was just thinking as I was reading through this book and I was hearing about ways in which, which songs had propelled, like singing praise to God had propelled people forward towards faithfulness. I thought, hmm, I wonder, I wonder if, if, if people have some lyrics that come to their mind. Boy, did you. As I just put the request out there and I just said, hey, sermon help, what are, some, what are some lyrics to some songs that stick in your mind and why was basically the question. <laughs> I can't, I, I've got a few here. But what I want you to observe is some of these, I, I'm going to, uh, since this, you guys put it out there with your names attached to it, some of you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share names and others I'm not going to share names and some I'm just going to read lyrics. But here's what I want you to see. What I want you to see is the variety in a way, the variety of ways in which that songs had an impact towards faithfulness. They weren't just songs of praise. They weren't songs of feel-good messages. Some of these are songs that, that they spoke to someone in times uh, of distress and difficulty. There's so many different ways in which songs spoke to people. Maggie shared the song, The Goodness of God, by the way, we're singing on Good Friday. There's my bait. And it was, it's in the bridge where it says, your goodness is running after me. And she writes, my, this, was my daily, this is my daily reminder that God is full of goodness and his love is always there for me. Or how about this? We all, how, about, how about this psalm? There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth that glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Somebody sharing the way in which the gospel was being reminded of with these, with these words. How about these lyrics? What will, what will it be like when you call my name? And that moment when I see you face to face. I'm waiting my whole life to hear you say, well done, well done, my good and faithful one. Kay Andrus writes, of, I, uh, of the old hymn, I, I heard an old story of how a Savior came to glory to save a wretch like me. And she says, this song convicted me way back when, and it has been my favorite all, uh, of all time. Tom, who shares of the first song that was played on the Sunday after he accepted Jesus, how about these words, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine, May thy Holy Spirit fill me. May I know thy power divine. Or how about the song, How Deep the Father's Love? Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed. I hear my mocking voice. That's a key phrase in this description. Call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. And Austin Rice always forces me to ask myself if I'm, I'm living a life where I would be someone who's calling out among the scoffers. Or how about the words of Phil Wickham's, this is amazing grace, this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. And I could keep going, there's more. If you want more, you can go to my Facebook page and read them all. There's plenty. But singing praise to God propels us towards faithfulness. Here's number four. It unites us in faith. 
Singing praises to God unites us in faith. Getty's right. The, the best, most perfect way that we, have, uh, that we have of expressing a sweet concord of mind to each other is by music. The best, most perfect way that we have of expressing a sweet concord of mind to each other is by music. Sometimes we forget that when we're singing praises, we, yes, we are singing to God, but we are also singing truths to the people around us. These are truths that we're declaring, truths that we're sharing, singing songs that we are saying in unison, that we are declaring, uniting truths. Like we, we, we read it earlier. I mean, we, we all, let's just acknowledge it. I, I love reading scripture together as a, as a community, and we need to keep doing it. But sometimes it can get kind of awkward, right? Like, how's the rhythm? How, are we, like how do we read this together with worship leaders? And, and we all read at different paces, and we read with different rhythms. Like, that can be really difficult. But do we hardly ever miss a beat when we're singing a melody together? There's unity, and there's power that unites us when we are declaring truths in faith together. Again, Getty's right. All our individual stories meet at the cross section of the worship service. We are reminded that we are not alone. We are members of a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multi-everything family. One of my routine worship gatherings that I love, one of my favorite moments is um, I, I go to a convention in southern Missouri every year in February, um, and, it, and it's at my my alma mater, and we end this convention, and oftentimes it is, it's what you would, you would call like a, a, a real trendy worship band, and, and some would call it showy, whatever. It's, it's a band, it's loud, it's noisy, there's lights, it's great stuff, but when it, the very, we, we sing the same two last songs with, with every single year with all the alumni from this school, with all the people that are pl- present, with all the people that attend every year, the same exact two songs that we sing to end, and there's never a band, it's just, they just get up and they sing uh, sing with a, led by a piano, sing two songs. The first one is, When I Survey the Wondrous, Wondrous Cross. And they sing it to remind us of what it is that really has united us together, to be reminded that all of those people there, the thousands of people there, that we are in this together. And we sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Thousands of people sing that together to remember who we are and that we're not alone. But then the second song that we're united in is wherever he leads me, I'll go. I don't know if you know this one, but here's how it goes. Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee, surrender your all today. And then the chorus goes, wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so, wherever he leads, I'll go. And to be there with church leaders, to be there with lay leaders, to be there with pastors, to be there with kids, to be there with all people, all declaring one thing, that we're on a mission together. Why praise through song? Because it unites us. And here's the last one. Why praise through song? Because it is a witness to the world. Yet he's right. Our churches are not just places where we are equipped and exhorted to witness to our neighbors who don't know Christ, though it certainly is that. Our churches are places that themselves bear witness. Our songs are the public manifesto of what we believe. Our songs are a public manifesto of what we believe. We sit here in a public setting. We declare songs together. We rejoice. We praise God for the work that he has done within our lives. These are the words and that we sing. And to anybody that may wander in, anybody that may be peeking into the window, whatever, anybody that appears online, what they hear is the songs that we sing together. Which again, another word of caution. When we sing the songs together and then we don't live like it, it's also a negative effect on our testimony. But when we sing praises to a God who is redeemer, God who is creator, the God who has saved, and we do so in in a unifying voice, it is a witness to those around. So three commitments. Three commitments that we can make in order to be people who are committed To singing praises is number one, saturate yourself in the praise of God. Saturate yourself in the praise of God. Because what we listen to impacts us. 
I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll put my dirty laundry out here in front of you. And, and uh, uh, Sarah and I sometimes enjoy just listening to secular, fun, goofy songs, and we were realizing we were doing it. And I mean, they weren't necessarily terrible songs. Like, uh, they were the songs we were, and then before we realize it, we, our kids start to like those artists, and our kids start to, um, uh, start to sing those songs, and, and, and then comes the, the really aha moment when there's some sort of lyric in a song that seems harmless, and when you look it up, it's like an innuendo for something, and your kids start singing, and you're like, I'm done, and it was a conviction that, that I recently had of, I need to be someone who saturates myself, myself in the praise of God. When I'm driving down the road in my car, when I'm singing in the shower, what music am I listening to? When I'm cleaning, what am I listening to? What am I singing? Sing as a family. Talk about the lyrics of the songs with your spouse and with your kids. Saturate yourself in the praise of God. Take advantage of every opportunities that you have to sing praise. Second, commit to communally praising God. Commit to communally praising God. This is a big one. It has grown unpopular to push towards the importance of gathering as a church family, and yet I think it's absolutely essential and I'm growing increasingly convicted of that even when we're out traveling on vacation I think it's important for me to take my family and and to go somewhere where we're committed to communally praising and singing praises to God because it is a cue for our spiritual health because what we praise impacts who we are Gates went so far as to say that our spiritual health depends on it Sounds like artists. But it's so true. It impacts us. It unites us. It propels us. It's a witness. Put a stake in the ground. I've said it before. I'll say it again. That one of the greatest things that my parents did for me when I was growing up and I was active in athletics. I I, I know there's a lot of things that try to be put on Sundays uh, nowadays for, for kids. But there was a lot when I was a kid too. And yet my parents drove a stake in the ground and said, not happening. And so I had to tell the baseball coach, hey, he can play today, but not until after noon, one, whatever. And as a result, that very first, that very first uh, uh, Sunday and when I went off to college and I decided that I wanted to sleep in instead, uh, God wouldn't leave me alone. It was so wrong, it, it, it had a pit in my stomach, and I never missed again. Because there was something that was formed within me about the priority and the value of singing praise to God that goes back to everything that we have already said. Commit to communally praising God. Make a stake in the ground. It's, it's one hour, okay, one hour and 15 minutes once a week at least for communally saying this is an important time for us. Last, this might be the hardest one for some of you, if you don't like singing, actively participate in singing praise. Whether you're tone deaf or you're about to try out for king and country, I don't know. (laughs) Actively participate in singing praise. One more One more little uh, Getty quote here that I'm quoting them so you don't get mad at me. Here's what they said. We live in a time when the importance of music in the church has been elevated greatly. Okay, so they're they're praising that's a good thing. But then they also put a little caveat in here. It says, not least because it has become commercially lucrative. But at the same time, we are in danger of lowering the the importance we place on singing together. Listening to each other mumbling quietly along as a band performs brilliantly on stage in a church building is not the same as singing together as a congregation. The medieval church made the error of treating the Lord's Supper as something for the congregation to watch as the professionals at the front participated. That seems ridiculous, right? And yet they say, might we not be in danger of doing the same thing with our music today? That it's something we participate in. And they go on, when we sing, it is a battle cry of, of hope for the wounded, for the weary, for the lost. Then they say, sing of Jesus, sing of your Lord and Savior, 
and the greatest friend. Sing yourself strong, sing the church strong, show up and sing up. It was really tempting uh, to do this. Uh, to really, uh, some of you are going to be like, well, why didn't you just do that? Uh, it was tempting today just to get up here and read Psalm 150, which calls us to praise God and then just be like, okay, let's do it. Some of you I noticed, because it felt kind of awkward there for a moment, that we only did two songs at the beginning today. And you're thinking we skipped the third one. <laughs> now, I think the best way for us to respond today is by closing out our gathering together by uh, just having an extended time of singing. Of singing praises, some great songs that, that I don't know for you it's been a great week. I don't know if it's been a really rough week. I don't know what the situation is, but I'm grateful that even the youth have come back in from class to join us for this time for, as we close out in these, these few songs. But regardless of how your week has been, let this be a time where you participate, you engage to singing praises to the one who is worthy of our praise. Let's prepare our hearts and let's reflect on the words. Let's be active with our minds. Let's be active with our tongues as we sing praise to God, and let's prepare our times by going to him in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. God, I just pray that these songs right now would just be an application of the text that we just read. That we would be a singing people. That sing of your praises, and God, that would overflow into our lives and the way in which we live. God, I just pray that, uh, that we would just be in awe of who you are, of your great and powerful deeds that you have done in our lives, that we would be responding to the grace in which you have shown to us, that we would be grateful and sing praise that you have been a mighty deliverer in our life, and that we would participate in that call of Psalm 150, that everything that has breath praise the Lord. For God, everything that has breath owes its existence to you. And God, if nothing else in this room, if there's those that that's just a realization that that breath would be used to glorify you even now. God, I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Would you stand and let's praise him. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Your riches. 
day when my strength is failing. The end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise
Jesus. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars. here and uh, and if you've got any questions about what's going on here at Cornerstone, your involvement, your next step, you just want to pray with someone, stop into the fireside room. If you're a guest with us, stop by the Welcome Center. We've got a gift for you and we'd like to get to know you just a little bit better. Um, But uh, the number of opportunities actually to continue in times of worship this week. Good Friday. Uh, This year is a little bit different than what we have uh, done the past uh, few years. That uh, if you enjoyed uh, just your time of singing and praising uh, God through song, Friday's for you. Um, that we're going to spend the vast majority of time just singing uh, together um, on, on Good Friday, remembering the reason that Good Friday is good. So we hope that you'll join us Friday at 7 o'clock uh, for that. Sunday's Easter. 
uh, in, invite someone along. We hope that somebody will come along with you and uh, invite them, bring them, walk with them, meet them in the parking lot. Um, and then afterwards is our annual extravaganza, um, which is um, egg pickup madness for all of our kids down in the gym. Uh, so we'd love to have you for that. And then the following week on April 7th is Discover Cornerstone. If you've never been a part of Discover Cornerstone, we hope that you would join us. Just please sign up at the Welcome Center so we know how much food that we need to prepare uh, for that. Cindy, would you close the prayer? Father God, how great you are. You, we love you so much, and we just praise you for the opportunity to be here today, God, for each one that walked in this door. May they just feel your presence in a mighty way. We came here, some of us today, just not really wanting to come, but God, as we walked through this door and felt your praise and your love, what a blessing that was. We just pray that you will find this congregation faithful, God, because we are followers and believers of you. I just pray that we will take this love and this generosity that you show us every day and take it to the world, God. Let it not be just in this room. Let it be outside. We love you and praise you for all you do. Amen.